Now am I too loud?
Thank you. I'll call this meeting of the Seaside Planning Commission to order. If you please uh, join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Hmm? <laughs> uh, this is the time and place duly advertised for the Seaside Planning Commission to hold its monthly meeting. Agenda items can be initiated by the general public, any legal <coughs> property owner, Seaside City Council, city staff, and the Seaside Planning Commission. Does anyone present feel the commission lacks the authority to hear any item on the agenda? Heard. Are there any corrections, deletions, or additions to the minutes of May 11th, 2021? None heard. The minutes are adopted. It is standard procedure for the members of the commission to visit the sites to be dealt with at these meetings. Do any of the commissioners wish to declare an ex parte contact or a conflict of interest? Well, I don't have an ex parte contact, but I re received my packet late and I didn't have time to read it or go through it. So I feel that I probably can't vote on anything, though I may be asking questions. Good. I'm happy that you'll be participating. Uh, well, if you want me to wear my mask, I'll wear my it's mask. It's still part of the state mandate that yes. I'm just not wearing it because it fogs my glasses and I can't read Sorry. anything. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Following public hearing requirements apply to the items on our agenda. The applicable criteria for the hearing items are listed in the staff reports prepared for this hearing. Testimony and evidence shall be directed toward the applicable criteria listed in the staff reports or other criteria in the plan or land use regulations which you believe applies to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals on that issue. The applicant will testify first, followed by any others in favor of the request, then any in opposition will testify, and then the applicant will be given time for rebuttal. Before testifying, please state your name and address for the record. The first public hearing on the agenda for this evening is 21-024 VRD, Mr. Planning Director. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the applicant is requesting a conditional use that will allow the establishment of a vacation rental dwelling at 332 7th Avenue. Subject property is zoned high density residential R3 and the applicant is requesting a maximum occupancy of nine persons over the age of three, no more than 10 regardless of age within the existing three bedroom uh, dwelling. The review will be conducted in accordance with Article 6 and Article 10 of the Seaside Zoning Ordinance, which establishes the review criteria and procedures for a conditional use. The specific review criterion for vacation rental dwellings is included in Section 6.137 of the Seaside Zoning Ordinance. Within the staff report, staffs identified the applicable review criteria, provided draft findings, conditions, and conclusions. If you have any questions about the information in the staff report, we'll try and answer them. Thank you. We have a representative for this application who would like to speak at this time. You can come on up and have a seat, state your name and address for the record, and then just let us know what you have to say. Hi there. My name is Patricia Wolf, and um, my address, my physical address, is um, 4010 East 66th Avenue in Anchorage, Alaska. However, the address um, that we have from here on East Seaside is 3327th Avenue. Okay, is there anything you'd like to let us know about what you're planning and what Absolutely. you want to do? Um, so um, are you guys in receipt of the letter that we sent with the packet? I didn't see it in the actual packet that mm -mm. I, I do not have a letter. Okay, that's you. okay. Um, so Joe and I have been looking for property here for many, many years. We spent decades here in Seaside. We really love this town. Um, we finally found the property of our dreams and are creating a legacy for our family. Um, done a lot of work already in the last 14 months on this property, bringing it up to um, up to code, and so we're just super excited and have lots more planned for it. And so, just wanted to share this opportunity with other families to enjoy the town that we like. And what would your long-term plans be with the property? Um, well, we're retiring soon in a few years, so we're hoping to kind of be going back and forth, snowboarding a little bit. Um, so that's our long-term our long-term plan is to spend more time here. Okay. Anything else? I think that's all 
I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, if not, if we have any other questions for you, we'll direct them to okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any el uh, anyone else who would like to speak in favor? Um, I don't know. Hmm. I'm Aaron Barker with uh, Beach Property Management and Beach House Vacation Rentals. Long time no see. <laughs> um, just wanted to introduce myself to those who might not be familiar with me and then I see a lot of familiar faces as well. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. For those of you who are new, I've lived here for 22 years and I've been doing this for almost all of them, both long-term and short-term. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. If somebody wanted to pin me to a corner and talk about all kinds of rentals, I could talk all day long, which generally I do. So I'd be happy to answer any questions um, if you have any. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Anyone else in favor? Uh, my name is Mark Hansen, and I'm the neighbor of the Wolves. I live at 328 Seventh Avenue. I've had short-term rental properties in the past. The house I'm living in now is a short-term rental. Um, I highly recommend you give them a license because they, they've got local people that take care of the property for them. And they also have a caveat as the, uh, an area they can park so all the vehicles will be off the street. And as you know, Franklin in that area is pretty tight. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and we've had issues with people parking in the wrong place and blah, blah, blah. But I highly recommend you do this because I think it'd be good for the community. And, and I like it because they won't park in front of my house, the people that are using short-term rentals. So I support it. All Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Anyone else in favor? This time, anyone who would like to speak in opposition? None. So I'll turn the discussion over to the commissioners. Well, I guess we just have one one language problem to deal with to start with. Make it quick. Uh, under uh, the paving requirement, the the language just seems a little uh, contradictory. It says the owner must have the off street parking area improved prior to any transient rental. And then it says they have a year to do this, but it makes it sound like they can't rent anything until they finish it, but they've got a year to do it. But within, if they take that year, they can't do it until they've paved it. So it's do you want me to take this or do you want to take it? I can certainly take it. Um, similar to last month's uh, South Prom property, the parking area is there. It's not clearly defined and not improved to the point where it's usable as a parking area for three vehicles the intent behind the language is to have them improve it with gravel markings to clearly indicate where their uh, guests are supposed to park and then have the surfacing done the paving the pavers whatever they so choose whatever is is approved by the planning director uh, within one year so we'd, we'd like to see the the actual improvement so it's a usable space prior to renting and then surfacing within a year so so improved doesn't necessarily mean paving Correct. At that point. Okay. All right. As long as that's understood, I guess. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. That was my main question. I have, imagine, okay. I have comments. <laughs> okay. um, we didn't receive our, uh, our maps that um, calculate the existing, the density map, the VRD density maps for this property, you know, within 100 feet, within 200 feet. That wasn't included in the packet. Um, just an FYI, but um, as uh, Mr. Hansen mentioned, Franklin is extremely narrow. It's maybe 20 feet wide, if, if that. My concern is you've got this, um, this cyclone fence pretty much around the property, except for where the entrance is, and I believe that's a gate, yes? Is that a gate? Okay and juggling three cars and backing out onto Franklin is extremely tight. Um, I, I have a question for you. To the north side of that, the entrance, there is also a cyclone fence that's next to the garage. That's really not a garage, it's a, it's a space. It's an outbuilding. Would, uh, and it looks like there's some gardening there. 
would uh, that be can thank you would you consider um, removing that to make the um, the ingress and egress a little bit more feasible because I have no reference <coughs> as to how wide that driveway is but you know it's average car absolutely so width. our plan is so what you're speaking of is um, the shop garage area there's no garage door on that um, right. that space between where the car is, dri is written mm -hmm. in and then mm -hmm. that, what you're speaking about some landscaping we're going to remove that um, okay. We're going to remove that, and we're actually our next plan is to replace the entire fence and then open up the gate wider okay. with a fence that slides um, amongst itself. So that's our next plan. So it actually will be much bigger. The um, the estimates we've been working with um, getting it'll be a lot bigger space. So yes, we are going to move the landscaping and and also the landscaping on this side of the fence on too. the south side. Yep. Yeah, it, I just noticed plan. it's extremely, extremely tight, and Franklin. Everybody is, has to pay attention when they're backing out so they don't back oh, out yeah. at the same time. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. and oncoming traffic, even though it's like 25 miles an hour. I lived across the street from, from this house, <laughs> so I know what it's like up there. Sure, we did, we did um, this past summer when we were here, we did have three cars there, um, and we, you know, we're just very careful moving it out, but our plan is to, is to make that fence um, the gate. Mm -hmm. wider and sure. is that uh, down the road or is that going to be in phase one of this that is process? that's our next that's our next improvement project Seems so like phase we one the one we just finished <laughs> yes okay. yes okay okay thank along you along with the paving required within one year right one year told. and that would be phase two i would think consider that as phase two of the parking issue wonderful thank you thank you that was my question any other concerns? We issues? covered mine. Comments? <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll make a motion that uh, the uh, board accept. 21-024 VRD. We have a second. Motion. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. And you have some work to do. <laughs> okay. All right. Our second uh, item on the agenda this evening is 21-026 CU. Mr. Blaine, director. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to develop a 28-unit apartment complex within the general commercial C3 zone. The subject property is located at 407 South Holiday Drive, and apartments are conditionally permitted in the zone. The proposed use will replace the existing commercial buildings and three separate apartment buildings with three separate apartment buildings, and the applicant's uh, the applicant plan, the applicants, geez, I can't even read. The applicant's plan calls for 47% of the off-street parking spaces to be designated as compact car spaces. Building A, located adjacent to Holiday Drive, will include office space and parking on the ground floor. The second and third floors will be four two-bedroom and two one-bedroom apartments. Building B, located adjacent to the east side of the property, will provide parking on the ground floor. The second and third floors will be four one-bedroom apartments. Building C, located in the southeast corner of the property, will provide parking and two one-bedroom ground floor apartments. The second and third floors will provide three one-bedroom apartments. Within the staff report, staffs identified the applicable review criteria, provided draft findings and conclusions and conditions. If you have any questions about the information in the staff report, I'll try and answer them. Thank you very much. And do we have someone who would like to be speak in favor of this? <coughs> Mark Mead, 89643 Ocean Drive, Warrenton, Oregon. This site right now is currently not very well used anyway. It's it's got the just a couple of storage buildings on it that are vacant right now. The proposal for this is to add more apartment usage to the seaside area closer to downtown. The owner of this complex was looking at several other pieces, but 
this is the closest one he could find in the downtown to redevelop into this. We've made the units along Holiday, so they have a balcony looking out at Holiday. Even though you can kind of see the river, but there are other buildings on the other side of the river from that. The building on the east side of the property, we didn't put any balconies on because the neighbor is a is a residential house there. So we were trying to not have the people looking out, you know, directly into his property. So that's why there's parking on the first floor of that one with the units being above that. One thing to note is that the property to the east, their garage does encroach on this property and their landscaping. And that's been noted clear back as early as in the 1940s. And there's a survey in the late 80s that, that shows the property line going through the part of their garage. So that's why we have a little jog in the building is so that we don't disrupt their garage and allows us a little bit of landscaping between our building and their garage. The third building, which is in the southeast corner of the property, you have Starbucks behind in their parking lot. So we have a small yard space between separating their parking lot and our building with the two ground floor units there being ADA type units with a little patio out with the yard and then the other units above that. We've tried to, I mean, we're kind of maximizing this property with the number of units, parking, it was a jug, juggling match to try and make everything fit, but we're, it's, we've got a little bit of landscaping buffers. The property to the south, the commercial building on Holiday, their very back corner also encroaches onto this property. So we've got a little landscape buff around the corner of their building so they don't have to tear that off and be disturbed. It's, it's tight, it's small, but it's near downtown and, and probably be one of the closest housing units to downtown area. That's apartment type units. If you've got any questions, I can try and answer them along the way. I'm sure we will. We'll, we'll get to that soon enough. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else would like to speak in favor? Anyone who would like to speak in opposite? Oh, you want to speak in favor? Please come on up. There's a lot on the agenda. <coughs> Aaron Barker, Beach Property Management. I just want to say thank you, Mark. He always does such a great job. And I was really impressed because I, I own and actually manage, the, I'm pretty sure it's on Avenue C, the, the owner has a full-time tenant there, and yeah. I thank you for being so considerate as you always are and do a good job. But I, I'm in great support of developing um, housing. Um, for the last several years, uh, we, we all know we have a housing shortage and we need more units available and especially ones close to downtown where people won't necessarily need a vehicle it's centrally located and people can walk to work in a lot of cases so i just want to express my strong support in approval all right thank you Aaron. anyone else in favor anyone who would like to speak in opposition all right we'll start the discussion I guess, uh, Mark, you can answer one question, which you'll probably be answering again with the other one, but we might as well get it out of the way. What is the actual use of these apartments? Why is there an office if it's apartments? And kind of clarify that if you will. What kind of housing is it? The office is because his office in his hotels that he owns is too small for himself to occupy. <laughs> So he needs a bigger office for running his hotels in town. So that's why we stuck the office down there in the corner. Well, that's for his for personal his own use. use. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then what type of units are these? I mean, are they're long -term two bedroom, short? one bedroom. I mean, if we were going to build them as a hotel, we wouldn't need to come to the planning commission because then it'd be outright use. So that's why we had to come to the planning commission so we can have, you know, rent them out as apartments instead of short term rentals because short term rental, we wouldn't have to come to you. It'd just be get a building permit and start. Are there limitations on, on how long? Like, do they take out a lease or is it for a certain period of time or? Um, I don't know that. I do know that part of the units will be some of his employees because he has a hundred and something employees between all the different hotels in Cannon Beach and Seaside area. So 
he's always short of housing for his own people. So I, I'm pretty sure that the building that's to the east, the one bedroom units there are probably gonna be his own employees. Just but those people, people, those employees are residents of Seaside and they need a place to live and work and stay. Yeah, and that's, that's the problem is that he's got employees that he can't find housing for. Okay. So yeah. that's, that was one of the reasons behind this was so he'd have more employee housing for himself. Okay. So these are apartments as you would apartments. apartments are. Yeah. All it's right. just the office was, like I said, for because his office is too small between all the businesses in town. Okay. All right, that's my... Mark, while you're oh, there, yeah. while you're there. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> you got your own parking spot here. Yeah. Um, I have a couple questions, I'm asking okay. that. To piggyback on what uh, Chris was saying, uh, so are these considered, I, I mean, they're not specifically and uh, strictly for his um, employees, no. but in addition to. Right. So are these going to be considered, I mean, they're, they're tiny. Well, yeah, they uh, are. They're small, and that's one reason for making yeah. them small is because then you can keep the rent a little lower. Right. So right. are they going to be um, considered workforce housing, low-income housing? Low-income housing is usually subsidized. We're not doing that. Workforce housing, what do you call workforce housing? It's market rate. So okay. whatever the market rate is, it's just... So I mean, no Airbnbs are being planned for this? Not at this moment, but do, right now... With the cost of building and even the city fees, it's I forget how many, it's just 150, 180 thousand dollars in fees just to the city on this just to build it. So when you look at all the fees and the building codes, there is no cheap way to build apartments. I know, but the reason I'm asking if if you're, but it's zoned, it's, it's, it's zoned it's, right now where we could have made it all Airbnb and not and never come to the planning commission. Well, when you, you know, yeah. this is, I think what's uh, referred to as mixed use. And yeah. I understood mixed use to be retail, office, and housing. Right. So I don't know where the mixed use is other than his office. own private office. Yeah. And well, he could rent that out later on to somebody, but well, and the other, are not. <laughs> the other reason I'm asking about trying to get it honed down on what type of housing is, because if it's, if you are offering those two bedroom units as um, VRD, Airbnb, right. you know, I correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, but um, according to Article 6, wouldn't you need a parking space per bedroom? No, you need a parking space per unit. Yeah. According, so, according to the ordinance, when you do a motel, you need one space per per unit, per unit itself. Okay. Right. Okay. So that it would actually that. go down. Yeah. Rather than okay, that cleared that up. So by building apartments, we had to increase the parking mm -hmm. instead of decreasing it. So that's one of the things to look at is that, you know, by building, you know, the apartment style, it's more parking required. And one last question, okay. I promise. And no, it's you're, all yours. you're good. Where is the ingress and egress? <laughs> Avenue C, up here in the top. Uh huh. That driveway right above Kevin's head, where the C is. That's okay, <laughs> that's okay. That's on the north side. Where is it on the west side? We don't have one. So that's the only point of ingress and right. egress. And so you're doing tandem parking. Yeah. So you'll have a sign parking for the units. So, like, if you look at any of those parking, like parking spaces, three and four, those are assigned to the two bedroom unit above. Mm -hmm. And so they will be assigned parking that way. Hmm. Or if we built it as hotel, we wouldn't have to have that second row parking. So that's one of the things to look at is that it's actually costing more money to build it as an apartment. Okay, Kathy, it's all yours. While we're talking about parking, it mentions that there's two uh, ADA compliant parking spaces that are not labeled on there, where would they be? So, this one is your van handicap ADA space back here, and this one is just a standard handicap because the sidewalk is wide enough for the unloading out of it. So, this is your van handicap space at your standard space. And where are the apartments that would be also ADA accessible? This right? is the ADA, totally ADA accessible unit, is right opposite that van space. Uh -huh. This one is what's called a type B space, which is not as restrictive for ADA stuff. Okay. So that's why their space is here to be able to get into this one. And the bike covered parking? There's bike covered parking 
underneath the stairway in these spaces, several locations. So are those loft spaces or are they open spaces? We haven't decided yet, <laughs> but they're undercover. Okay. And these right because here. Because the intent of the TSP is to, to encourage use of bicycles instead of cars and driving. Right. Um, and tandem parking like this Leads seems more complicated towards. with such a narrow yes. ingress and right. egress and only one way in and one way out. Um, is there any provision for charging for parking so people are less likely to want to park a car and to bring a, bring a bicycle? No, but he's hoping more other hotel type employees in the area are living there and then we did we can increase the bike parking where those bikes are and then also underneath the stairways we can add more bike parking later so the idea is that if we have less cars we could add more bike parking around there well and if the bike parking isn't secure then nobody will want to use the bike parking for the bikes no, because it, they it, won't be around it's underneath the units and you're hidden away underneath there, so you're more secure than you would be otherwise. Okay. Um, There's some other part of the question, but it'll, I'll get to it in a second. I can't remember at the moment what else there was. So a question I guess I would have too. Um, it looks like if you don't park in the complex, there's no parking on C, so you'll be parking on holiday. And is there access from Holiday into the buildings from there, or do they have to walk around? You go up to Avenue C and in, and there is two openings. There's an opening right here and an opening here to where you could get through between the cars to get to the others. But otherwise, I just come up to Avenue C and down the walk. So it's not as attractive as what I'm saying. Right. Which I yeah. like. And that's why the two back buildings, the outside isn't built as attractive as the one on holiday. Open bike parking down there is not gonna. Well, I have a, don't, don't go anywhere, but I have a question for Kevin right now. Uh, I understand why you're doing the stack parking. Yeah. But could you talk about that? I don't think there's any place in the city, hotels, apartments, anything that has stack parking like this. Well, there's so units there's, are there they, it, primarily the single family dwellings that have done stack parking but there's no there's no restriction in the zoning ordinance regarding that um if they if if they have stack parking and they're required to have two for a for a dwelling unit and and they have those stacked then they'll they'll comply with the off-street parking requirements in the ordinance so for you it's, it's just a matter of compliance with the ordinance kind of as a first step right okay right. yeah if they tried to stack three in and say oh well yeah we're going to stack three in no they they couldn't do that and still meet the requirement because you couldn't get in and out of those spaces but having to move your own car to get out for yourself that's i mean i have to do that myself <laughs> is there parking on holiday right there yes there is mm -hmm. okay So what, what are, what, could you just go over again what the parking requirements are for this for as, a, as an apartment building and for two bedroom and one bedroom apartment? So, so I, I, one and one I and think I broke it down, I think I broke it down in the, in the report. Um, and if I didn't, I should have. It looked like it was one and a half okay. for the two and one so, for the one. So the new, the new parking requirements that, that you reviewed and the council has adopted now um they require um for apartments uh and and there i i should point out if they got ready to say oh we want to turn these into condominiums they couldn't do it because they wouldn't meet the off street parking requirements for a condo but for apartments it's got uh for a studio apartment it's one space for a one bedroom it's 1.25 spaces and for a two bedroom, it's 1.5. If you go over the two bedroom, then you're into the two. And if you have a 10 bedroom, it's still two. So what the planning commission reviewed and recommended to the city council, that was adopted by the city council. So those are our new off street parking requirements. All reviewed and approved or recommended approval to the council. So 
help me understand how assigned parking spaces with assigned compact spaces is going to work with apartments that you're requiring the people that rent in those apartments to have compact cars? Some of them, yes, or they can't rent the unit. Okay. Something so I've never why, encountered as a renter. But why in their lease agreements, they'll be having to specify what they have for cars. How come I'm only counting up 20? <laughs> 24 what? There's a breakdown of the parking, but you probably can't read it on the right-hand side of the site plan. Okay, it's a little hard to read it when it's squished down on size. How does that work, Mark? You charge more for a unit that doesn't have a compact space? No, you charge more for a two-bedroom unit. Yeah. <laughs> so the two-bedroom unit automatically gets a bigger car? Not necessarily, but they get two parking spaces for sure, assigned. So in a sense, you are charging for parking. It's no different than any other apartment complex. You pay, you know, your rent and you get parking provided. It's just that on these, it's a no lot different of than apartment complexes. I'm sorry, here, but it is different than that's one of the way, one of the tools to help reduce traffic right. and parking is to yeah, have that be a separate it. charge to make people see this is your lease and this is your additional parking charge. Yeah. Most of these parking spaces are covered by the floors up above, so they'll be partially out of the weather. Okay, I have something really silly to ask. No matter how many times I count this, you know, and counting as a stacked set of parking as one unit, we have 28 unit apartments, 28 units, right? Right, but most the of them are one bedroom. Okay. And I still come up with only 24 parking units. Um, no. I'm counting the, the stack well, as one set because if those go to the same unit, right? Right. Because they okay. have to. So, man, okay. So I come one. up with 28 plus two hands. Where'd you come up with the 28? Well, I just How did I miss those? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then there's four there that are single. And then these. Yeah. One, one, two, three, four three, there, four, and then two handicaps. Ah, they didn't have little cars in them. Oh, right. Okay. But, but still, then right. that's only still 26 Remember, because it's, one, two, they're three, stacked. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 30, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So that means no guest parking and no employee parking for the office. Handicaps. Yeah, Kevin, I guess that's a question for the retail space. Do you have to have a park? Do you have to have a parking spot for the office? Yeah, they 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 need to have. Um, I mean that that space would be governed by whatever. If they if they said. We've got office space in there, but we're going to use it as storage. So they're not, they're not going to get charged for parking. But I think I said in the in the staff report, I identified that their overage of spaces would only allow for a certain number of, of employees, and that is tied to. It's not just Mark broke it out at the one per four hundred for the for the requirement for office space, but you still have to figure in employees, and so that overage only allows you up to, I think it was three, yeah. mm -hmm. three employees. Yeah, employees. And, if, and if that was Masood's office and the rest of it was not open with, with additional employees, then he'd actually have excess. But that's, mm -hmm. that's a matter of them meeting that requirement based, but what on, I, based so on the use. What I heard Mark say though, was that Masood was gonna <coughs> use it as his office, but not necessarily his office. His personal office. Okay. Right now his personal office is at River Inn uh -huh. on the first floor and it's not big enough to run his operation i must yeah he needs I'm more making, space right. for his own own personal office but he usually parks over there and walks to all of his properties okay from there so that's, he doesn't have employees in his office not in his office no they're out in the management area and they have another office there where okay. employees are at for bookkeeping and stuff okay and if he moves his bookkeeper over his bookkeeper will be renting in one of these units too got it 
So that's another advantage of, uh, of putting some of your own employees in the units. That, that helps. I think as much as as much as this is needed in Seaside, the parking is going to be an, an issue in the future. It, it's going to be a, have to be really controlled. Yes. Yeah. And he's well aware of that one. I'm hopeful that this, you know, hopefully we can maybe implement some uh, encouragement to not have a car and live and work downtown in the downtown area. Right take the bus to where you need to, ride your bike where you need to. And yes, this looks compliment, you know, complicated and daunting in my mind for people to live there and switch how to move around in the area. But I think that you know, this may be the wave of the future. Well, right now, if you look at several of his maids walk to work right now, mm -hmm. and this would be a closer walk for them. Exactly. So yeah. that's why they may be moved over into this building. Or even if you have a car, if you don't need to move it all the time, that's a that's a plus right there too. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, been one of the biggest things. You probably already know this that with our workforce being forced out of town, now they have to bring their cars right to town, and there's no place to park them. And it's causing a problem in his own hotels with having maids come in and nowhere for them to park. So that that was his first reason for buying this property was having three of his properties right close by that they can walk to. I actually had to rent spaces for my employees to park from somebody else That's right. to keep them out of our parking lot so our customers could park. Is there any available motorcycle or scooter parking? If you had it, you could park them in the place of one of the cars so you could park two motorcycles in there or two scooters. That's great. That's great. Okay, I'm back to Kevin for condition one. We probably just went over this and I got to reconfirm it here. Uh, it's what we were talking about with the office and employees and that sort of thing. The language there is that there's three spaces for employees, but you may need ADA. Obviously, you went with the ADA, which means we don't have employees, so we're not worried about those three spaces now. So I guess maybe that just needs to be taken out or well, I, leave the, it in. The, the, the condition was based on if, and, and I discussed this with the building official, um, if in fact an ADA space is going to be required under under the building code, and the building code has changed as far as how they how they figure out ADA spaces that used to be a simple formula, now it's a lot more complicated. Um, but if in fact he has an office space in there, it may be that he's going to have to provide one uh, ADA space. And I think Bob even looked at the plan and said it looked like they could they could potentially accommodate that. But that's going to that I think that's still going to have to be addressed to satisfy. Um, uh, satisfied Bob during the during the final plan review. Right. Okay. So so the language there still kind of addresses the issue. It isn't. It, it it's still saying applies. something that's not being yeah. done. Or okay. would would the fact that at this point with the ADA and there there's no room for three more parking spaces, which would mean that that would restrict by the very nature of that yeah. the use of that office to his personal office. Right, and that's why he isn't objecting to that being in there at all. There's a, I'm, I'm guessing a typo in condition two because I'm assuming you're not providing for a short in stature bike space, bike parking space. Is it supposed to be at least one short term bike parking? Yes. It just says one short bike. Oh, one short term. <laughs> That's what I meant with the short in stature. I mean, yes. my bikes aren't tall, but when I, I didn't when expect I read a special that, parking short space term, for it. But it's yeah. not there. <laughs> okay, Lisa, we, I, I kind of feel like we're getting to the point uh, where the list of conditions, conclusions to criteria one, conditions one through six, seem to address the kinds of things that you'll need to do and that Kevin will be able to uh, keep an eye on. Uh, it seems to me the only issues that we would have that might change all of this are the parking and egress, ingress and egress being the one thing. And if, does anyone have issues with that at this point? Or? I, I just have a quick question because I don't, I didn't ask and I don't remember whether I read it in this one or the next one about emergency vehicles being able to access and get in there with right. the, all the cars parked in there yeah. and then back out again. 
the fire code required the 26 foot driveway coming in that we have okay and then they're allowed to back out because of the distance in on the fire code okay. the other project that you're looking at later we have a okay. t-turn area and stuff that's required because of the right. distance in but even even so con condition six might cover that in, yeah. in a sense of your coordinating with Kevin and making sure you meet all the code stuff even if it may be something yeah. we've missed discussing tonight so. right okay. if they ran into an issue during during final plan review when they had to modify things so long as they're basically keeping the the base approval of of the request in intact then I don't have I don't have any issues with it if if you don't um, if there was a if there was a major change or if um, I said, no, you're not going to be able to do that, you know, mark or whatever. They try to work out a solution. And I say, no, I don't think that's mm -hmm. consistent with that. Then that could still be brought back to you to say, well, Kevin doesn't think it's right. Uh, Mark does think it's right. Then you could actually take a look at it and say, we agree, we disagree, or no punt. And I try to put those in, I, I mean, I try to leave that as kind of a standard condition of approval so that you don't get locked into an absolute, oh, you know, you, you, can't, you can't modify anything. That doesn't help the applicant or the planning commission or staff. And also, are we correct in understanding that apartment buildings are not eligible for VRDs? So if anyone has a concern about that, they're just not allowed. They're correct. I mean, in, in this zone, Keep in mind, in this zone, if that was being done, if they wanted to convert that over to a hotel motel, uh, they could. It's an outright permitted use in the zone. But that's not what Mark is. Yeah, it's not what we're asking for. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Right. Well, that was, we just wanted to confirm that these are actually what we understand as apartments, which are permanent living facilities. Now, permanent can be anything that people move, move right. on, but. But it's they will never permanent. They will never be condominiums because they, without a variance anyway, they could never become condominiums because they'd be way under on the off street parking requirements. Okay. Uh, any other questions, comments, concerns? Well, on that note, I'll file a motion that we approve 21 026 CU. I'll second it. You have a first and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That one has gone through. Uh, our final item for this evening is 21027CU. Mr. Planning Director. Okay, Mr. Chairman, the applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to develop a 59-unit apartment complex within the general commercial C3 zone. The subject property is located at 1000 South Holiday, and apartments are conditionally permitted in the zone. The proposed use will replace the existing commercial and residential buildings with three separate apartment buildings and one building dedicated to office, lobby, and housekeeping. The applicant's plan calls for 48.4% of the off-street parking spaces to be designated as compact car spaces. Building A facing the Nicanicum River will be a three-story building with nine two-bedroom apartment units on each floor for a total of 27 units. Building B along the south property line will be, three, will be a three-story building with eight two-bedroom apartment units on each floor for a total of 24 units. The plan calls for the building to be set back 10 feet from the property line and the easterly, and the easterly unit will be an ADA type unit. A uh, mixed use building south of the entrance and adjacent to South Holiday will be a three story with two office spaces on the ground floor. The second and third floors will be four one bedroom unit apartments on each floor for a total of eight units. Office and housekeeping north of the entrance and adjacent to South Holiday will be two stories with an office and housekeeping area on the ground floor and second floor loft area. Uh, within the staff report, staff's identified the applicable review criteria and provided draft findings, conclusions, and conditions. And I should point out that you have all received a number of comments from neighboring property owners regarding this request. If you have any questions about the information in the staff report, I'll try and answer them. Right. Can we have someone to speak in favor? <laughs> Give your name and address again, please. <clears throat> Mark Mead, 89643 Ocean Drive, Warrenton, Oregon, 97146. 
This complex has the parking all centered in the middle of it. We looked at we looked at putting the southern building against the Red Lion, used to be the old Shiloh building, and then we moved it back to the other side because of we didn't want people staring into the bedrooms of the adjacent building that way. Uh, the parking is in the center. Right now, when you look at San Parker Village next door, they are using part of this property as an exit, but they don't have any easement or a right given to them for that use that they use right now. There is a 10 foot wide storm sewer easement between down between the buildings. The city at the time Sandpiper was built reduced that easement a little bit to allow them to get another unit in. We're not looking at, we're actually sitting a little bit further away from that easement to give a bigger buffer between the units and Riley's restaurant and then the unit at the river and the Sandpiper condominium unit. When you look at the riverbank, when Sandpiper was done, we redid the riverbank with small riprap along it and continued it clear across this property at that time. So that was all put in at the same time. The river actually, vegetation actually angles away in this property. So the Sandpiper people were concerned about river and vegetation and the aquatic stuff. Well, we're actually as you progress north, moving further away from it than they are currently all the way across the front of their property. So that's, their concern there is, I don't know how to put it, but, but we're, we're, we're progressively getting further away from the, from the edge of the riverbank and the DSL line than they are in that part. As far as Mansell Island, we're further away from it than they are and by putting units all along the front not allowing for pedestrians to walk out to the front of the river we're trying to discourage people if they're not living that unit from being out along the riverbank which is the same thing in their complex the runoff there's a storm sewer pipe that the city has that runs all the way down the south property line and dumps out to actually dumps out on the estuary right in front of the corner of the Sandpiper building. That serves a whole bunch of Holiday Street and interconnecting streets. So it's got a lot of storm runoff that runs out and at times there's a little oil sheen out there but that's coming off of the streets. Our storm drainage will be oil separator catch basins inside and part of the area to the north will be a drainage swale to help treat some of the water and then the other part of our water will be connected into that storm sewer line that the city already has. Parking, right now we're meeting the current city parking requirements. If we built this as a hotel, again, it would be one space instead of being multiple spaces so we'd have a smaller parking lot if we built it as a hotel. The lobby breakfast room the reason it says lobby reps because originally the concept was to make this all into hotel type units and then he's gone back to making it into apartments. So the lobby breakfast area will be rental office to start with and then maintenance room in the back for landscaping and maintenance of the complex. And then the other part will be an open common area just for use of the residents in the building, not for outside people, but so if the residents Promise. want to entertain people or something they can sign up to use that building and and use that space which should help cut down on noise from other other units and outside noise with it being clear in the northeast corner of the property and again if this was being built as a hotel we wouldn't be here asking for the for this because Hotel motel is outright usage where apartments is the conditional use. So that's why we're here for conditional use. <coughs> the compact parking is mostly along the north side with the non-compact being next to the units and then to the southerly side of the property. Just kind of separating compacts from the standard units. This one doesn't have any covered parking and so the parking would not be assigned. It would just become first come first serve like most apartment complexes. The first floor of that one building is an office retail space. Right now we're looking at 
like the eye doctor that's currently occupying the front of the one building may be one of the tenants in there to give them a space to go to because for them to find another space in town would be difficult. So that's what's being looked at and that'll be negotiated with them to see if we can get them to move in there because to have an automatic tenant would be you know, advantageous for him for the office space in there. And that's why the office, two office spaces are split up the way they are so that it's close to the same size that they currently lease in the other building that's there. So we have office space on holiday, residential on the rest of it. Okay. If you have any questions, then I'm here to answer questions later on. Okay, close. Anyone else who would like to speak in favor? Anyone who would like to speak in opposition? <coughs> Hello. My name is Patrick Roche. I live at the Sandpiper Village at 1108 South Holiday in Seaside. Um, in part, I'm representing a group of people that aren't able to come, and they had the courtesy to send me their ideas and concerns, so I'm acting on their behalf in part. Some people did send in notes and letters to the appropriate uh, places, so there, you may have that paperwork in we front do, of you. We do have those, yes. W what I have is a punch list of sorts that I did uh, hand carry to both departments, to the city, and so you may see something like this. I think, I that's think we, what have, I'm we have that as well. Mm -hmm. this, uh, is that what you, you have? No. No, this is a little different. It has your name on it. Can I approach? Yeah, please, come oh. on up and take a look at it. Is that the one I have? No, you're good. Okay. I got notification about this event on Friday. I don't know that the person is renting the I place, leasing it, was even notified at all. And I only know of one person in our complex. And it's the rules for notification are clear. So I understand why it happened. In any case, we'll move on. Um, I wanted to make a note about the tax impact because clarification on what this is really going to be is not clear. I don't know what an apartment is. Is Can they be used for other things? And if you look in the C3 code stuff, it mentions that's a potential. So the reason I brought up the tax part of it is I don't know if the city would consider that or, or if if that property changes its image for whatever reason, how, whatever you want to call it, how does that impact the city? There could be a revenue problem. I don't know. But there's a lot of potential tax money if it's a hotel and far less if it's anything else. Is that correct? Uh, Kevin, that's a question that maybe say, you can answer. Say, say that again. Hotels are taxed by occupancy. Condos, short-term vacation rentals, Airbnbs have a fee, but they're not taxed in the same way, nor in the same kind of amounts. Is well, that, is yeah, I, I mean, there's there's the there's the property tax that you pay, which is, I mean, that's all run by the county assessor's office. Understood. But if you if you have that as an apartment complex, then um, you're you're not paying. I mean, other than a business license, a modified business license fee. Um, you're not paying any transient room tax. If, in fact, you open that property up or you take one building and, and turn that into an apartment or into a motel, then that's going to wind up paying a transient room tax, uh, you know, based, based on, on, their, um, uh, on their rent. They're going to be paying transient room tax on that property. So actually, if, it, if it's used for a motel use, you're going to wind up paying more taxes than you would as, as an apartment but I don't know how the county assessor's office would structure that as far as property tax goes. I, I just want you to be aware that we're aware. Uh, on, on to item two. There's an environmental impact on the Kankum River. There's an island out there that's full of wildlife. There's plants. There's probably 12 species of birds, et cetera, et cetera, along with the plants and so forth. When I check with the uh, state, they said that because the size of the property and the sort of housing around it, the only supervision or constraints they can put on is by calling the state police if someone goes to the island and causes damage or threatens the wildlife. 
and that's happened on several occasions. It's been witnessed by multiple people. So we have some concern about limiting people from going there, even though we can't stop people, but if they do something that would be harmful to the environment or to the wildlife, then it becomes a legal issue. And I've been told the state police are under that jurisdiction, that the Department of Agriculture is not, Fish and Game is not. Uh, item three, uh, the traffic and congestion there currently for at least the uh, village is pretty tough because we have large trucks that park on either side of either exit and it is really tricky to get out. That aside, the easement between the restaurant and this new structure is a bit confusing. Uh, and I know that, I believe I know, that the fire department has final say on is this adequate? Because right now, if a fire truck has to come in, there's sort of a U-turn they can make by Riley's and they can take a left through the condo garages and then have an exit on the south side. But the easement uh, between this new structure, if it should go in, and Riley's is not very clear. And I don't, I don't think if if I understand the marks, the survey marks on there, it, it looks really convoluted. I just, I just don't see how they can get any kind of a, a garbage truck, a delivery truck, a fire truck, any safety equipment in there. If they cut that, that easement in half with a fence, which isn't des uh, described, it just says a fence. We don't know if it's five feet or 10 feet or what it's made of. It's gonna affect both the restaurant and the apartment complex and uh, it's a safety concern. So I'm sure that's gonna be looked at by somebody. But the plans itself, if you look there, there isn't a lot of wiggle room. And as far as the easements, the, the original plans for um, the village was, uh, it's basically shared property by three people, the city, that are in our company and the village. So we all kind of share that easement area. How, what it's gonna look like isn't clear to me. That was a concern. The other, uh, on to item four, parking. I used to own a home in Seaside at the Cove and across from me was an Airbnb and there was also several units that were rented. It was not unusual for, for four adults to live in one of those apartments and there would be at least four cars if not more. And they were parking on bike lanes, in fire lanes, on and on. And the Airbnb, same deal. The level of supervision and management, they did their best to control it, but often there'd be a restriction of six people staying in the Airbnb and there'd be a dozen people. And between the trash and the lack of parking and safety issues and access to the main road, I'm wondering if we're gonna see the same sort of thing here. It just doesn't seem like the par parking is realistically gonna meet the anticipated issues that are gonna be there. So if you have a two bedroom apartment and the state rule on rental is if you have two, if you have a two bedroom, you can have two adults in one, two in the other, and the family room can be used in any way they choose. So if you have children or whatever. So if you even just assign three cars to a unit and there's, 60 units, I'll round it up, that's 180 cars. And then there's no parking for the staff that I could see, and there's no parking for overflow for guests. And the last time something like this was attempted, the surrounding businesses were affected because they were using Napa as a parking lot, as well as some other places. Even the village, they were parking there because there was no parking at the restaurant. And so I'm just, I'm not complaining, I'm just saying these are things that we're worried about and hopefully it'll be addressed in a practical way. But if they think there's only gonna be one car per unit or whatever the rule is, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> That's an opinion, I can't prove it other than where I used to live, it was a common issue. Uh, so the description of the, of the apartments right now are apartments, is that, can that be changed and when I looked in the, CS, the C3 code on other uses, it mentions condos, vacation, and other dwellings because it's a generalized C3 code. 
I believe I'm reading that right. So there's a list of different things that property can be used for that are acceptable under um, a challenge by the city or by whoever. Is that clear? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I will try and address these. It's, it's getting to be a list, but we'll try and okay. have some now, answers for you once you've got them out. So, so I put down some examples of what the rule says you can put there. And I don't know that they're going to start out as apartments and change into something. I was unaware that that could happen, but well, well just so we can move beyond on that one point, maybe okay. maybe I can say something and tell me if I'm wrong, Kevin. VRDs, no, they can't be used as VRDs, no matter what it is, whether it's a hotel or whether it's apartments. That's not okay. allowable okay. use. Uh, condos, probably the same situation as the last one, where the parking requirements would limit it from ever being condos. So no, correct. Okay, uh, it is possible to be used as a hotel, which is a permitted use. And I would assume that there is the, a possibility that they could decide to make it a hotel instead of an apartment, but they wouldn't need any permission to do that in the first place anyway. Um, so, long as, so long as they satisfy uh, Bob Mitchell, the building official, and there's no change in the systems development fees, which it would probably be, I'm guessing that would probably be lower, but uh, I, I haven't run the, run the numbers, but I mean, other than, I, I mean, if, if you have a building and it could be utilized um, because the parking requirement is actually less for a, for a motel development and, and you know, they, if, if they wanted to build the exact same structures that's there right now and say, this is going to be a high-end motel, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be looking at this. Okay, now the, quest the question though specifically here is, if they build it as apartments, could they then come back later and say, well, we don't want them to be apartments in the war, we want them to be a motel. It doesn't make sense with two bedrooms and stuff, but suppose they did, that. could they do that? Yes. Okay. And that's an outright permitted use, so we wouldn't have anything to say about it anyway. They Understood. Didn't come to us. So. Okay. Uh, thing about pets, I don't see any facility for that. Uh, in the rental agreement for the state of Oregon, it allows you to have a 25 pound fish. I'm not kidding. It says that in the rules. But you can have a dog and it has to be under 25 pounds and I don't see any facility for pets on the property, which means where do people walk them and what assurance do we have that they'll manage them and uh, it's just a concern, something to think about. As far as the noise, lighting and deck use on the west side, we can hear people talking on the other side of the river quite clearly. Even the smallest dog we can hear. So if they put a bunch of units on the west side and they decide to put in fire rings and play music loud or whatever, it's gonna impact both sides of the river probably. So the level of supervision in regards to that is something that we're concerned about. How it's managed is up to the owner, of course. Um, I mentioned the easement for deliveries, garbage, emergency vehicles on specifically on the site that the restaurant is. Uh, the owner isn't up to speed on this, by the way. I've spoken to him. Uh, it, it's just, I don't think he's completely aware of the impact it, it could have positively and negatively. Uh, security for the place with that many units, who's gonna monitor it? The police are kind of busy right now. They've got seven people, I think, on their staff. And with that many units, people are people and things are gonna happen. I don't know if you're going to assign a security person to that sort of thing or is that even done? Do other, like at Wyndham, they have folks that walk around and keep an eye on things. That's a big place. But I don't know what, if any plans they have for this one. But it is something to think about. We do have problems with transients and theft and uh, people breaking rules, sleeping under. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna jump in quick and address some of these while I've still got the idea fresh in my head. Again, check me, Kevin. Uh, for something like this, this, that would probably be more of an issue for the city council. Okay. And as the density of the city increases, uh, certainly a, a larger police uh, presence may be required, but that would be up to them right now. I think that it is what it is, and maybe we need to look at, at increasing that or changing it or, or having to deal with greater density in the city, but I think that would be a city council issue, not ours. Okay. Also, I think on Thursday there's going to be a... Uh, meeting on homeless in the uh, convention center right. at six o'clock. So if those are concerns of yours, you may consider going to that on I'm Thursday. I'm invited. 
I think everybody's invited. Everybody's right? open to the public. public. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you, but it, you can no, go. No, no. Got, got a few more. Uh, I yeah. Think we're getting near the end. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, the services that are available for the city now are obviously maybe not. I shouldn't use that word. The system's being taxed. There's only so many firemen, so many policemen, so many medics. I don't know that there's a transportation system that's adequate for getting people to and from work if they live there. I think there's a bus that comes by twice a day. And one of our, our members was really concerned about social services and mental health and all that. If you have 60 units and there's 120 people, which would be conservative, they're gonna need help with different things, especially if they have family members. And so that's something that might impact the whole community when you have that many people. Are they being served adequately and appropriately and is there any future in that being addressed? Uh, is there gonna be a staff on site and are they going to be available for 24 hours? If there's a problem with something that goes on, it's usually, my experience has been, after 11 o'clock, all bets are off. You really have to be diligent and careful about going out and where you go and so forth in that area uh, because the, it's still basically a business community, restaurant, funny shop across the way and so forth. So. Um, I don't know if they have plans on staffing anyone there that if there is a concern, do we end up calling somebody in Portland? How do we communicate with them if there's an issue between one property and the other? I don't know how that gets done either. What's it? It's just how a heads up thing, right? <laughs> I think it would be no different than your neighbor. If you lived well, in a single I, dwelling I've home actually and lived a... in apartments where they had security staff, they had landscapers on site, they had, uh, you know, you press a button and somebody would come and see what was going on. Parking issues, fights, whatever. Uh, not to be down on that. Um, is it going to be a multi-use property because they want to put in a, a breakfast nook or something? Would that change the status of the apartment complex? I've been in an apartment complex that had all those things. Well, it might, but I think or they, Mark answered that question that that was originally something they were considering when they were maybe con talking about it being a hotel, but that uh, is not what's happening. Okay. That will no longer be breakfast nook. It won't, it, it's, he said what it would be is more like a common area for people to use as a meeting area if they had guests or something. Understood. So I think That's we Cabana. can just dispense with okay. that one for the time being. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then I think the last thing is the fence that would go along Riley's, there's this descriptor on it mentions plants. It shows on the property line, the, the uh, uh, survey boundaries, that there's gonna be a fence, but it doesn't describe what that looks like if there's exit points or whatever. The one on the north side says six feet. I assume it'd be, I don't know what it's gonna be, but th that's not clear in the plans. I think that does it. Okay. Oh, I mean, if I could. <laughs> All right, we will try and address some of these issues to the best of our ability. Uh, if we, we, we miss something, or you're, you're welcome to raise your hand and say, what about that? We didn't talk about it. But we'll try and address these issues as best we can. So okay. thanks very much for your input. And uh, you can go ahead and have a seat. We'll I do have a background in neuro rehab, by the way. So <laughs> some of these social issues I'm well aware of. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? Please come on up. Not so much in opposition, but I don't want you to blindside the fire department and cut Sandpiper off from being able to have fire protection. If a fire truck is coming in from the right on oh, the Oh, I'm plant, sorry, you need to uh, give your name and address. Oh, it. Scott Alderson, I'm at Sandpiper. Uh, your full address, it's for the- 1108 South Holiday Drive, Unit 34. That'll do it, okay. Okay, if, if the truck com fire truck comes in, they're moving that fence or splitting the difference, basically. So now the fire truck is close to the restaurant. I don't think fire trucks are really great at 90 degree turns, which means Sandpiper no longer has fire protection. Isn't that an issue? Uh, I think that's if, one If a fire truck can't come down, Sandpiper's on the left, fire truck can't come down, 
we don't have fire protection. On the other end, we're wide enough they can make the turn. But God help them if they tried to back out of there. That's a long ways. Okay. And it's, a, it's okay to drive through, but you can't back a fire truck out like that. So my concern is they want to have the fence 10 feet from their building, which leaves, what, 12 feet? Maybe, not counting the eaves at the restaurant. How's a fire truck going to navigate that and make a 90 degree turn? Just asking. Okay. That's it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and w real quick, it's r their parking lot basically is right across the street from the police department parking lot. Mm -hmm. I hope they don't have an emergency during the rush hour. <laughs> All right. Anyone else would like to speak at this time in opposition? Or? All right. At this time, we'll turn the discussion over to the commissioners, uh, maybe in the interest of moving things along a little bit. Do you want Mark to Oh, do you want to rebut at this time, Mark? <clears throat> rebuttal. Sorry, yeah. We're going to be asking a lot of these questions anyway, well, that's so. That's fine. <laughs> Mark made again. When Sandpiper was developed, it was developed as a standalone property with no access through this property for fire department. So it required an easement or anything across there. When the Sandpiper was designed, it was passed by the fire department as no access there it just happens to be paved and they happen to use it but they don't own it so that's that's what it comes down to in the restaurant they have a back door there but when they were built originally that was going to be landscaping but it got paved over and just something they've been using all these years but their fire truck access is actually from the other sides of the buildings um, yeah, but a question would be if the fire department was can, is going to look at this right. and approve it, and if they had an issue, you would deal with it. At yeah, time, but it's not like it's going to be impossible to get. No, but the Sandpiper Village was built based upon fire truck access coming in only from Holiday and, and backing back out, not looping through this property at the original design of it, because I did the original design for the site layout. So that's why I real familiar with that one okay. and as far as having security on site you know apartment complex this size just doesn't have enough money to provide for security or somebody 24 hours a day there may be a manager living on site that's available but that's not a requirement for this type of property and noise off the decks and stuff that's why we didn't put any walkways through out to the river was to stop people from going out there so that you know you're only going to have the people from the units themselves out there i think he was talking about decks maybe on b on the on the, on south, the building the, well, south face of b is that well along the river i think is where he was talking about was, and, no, i thought he was talking about between oh between the two yeah. yeah we have a yard area there but that's reason we're putting the fences for the tenant use and the fence can't be any higher than six feet without planning commission approval right. so it'll be six foot or less don't know what it'll be but that's now when you say there's a yard area is it right a, a large enough yard for people to go out and be in it's 10 feet yeah you got 10 feet i mean okay. that's not i mean that's from me to you but that's not real big but well, that's, that's yeah big enough though it's not just a only strip. <laughs> only the ground floor units can be able to access it because the upstairs units right. aren't going to be able to access okay. that okay and the traffic again you know there's no easements for their access they just it's paved and they just happen to use it, but that's that's just something they've been using for years. Um, city services, that's part of the city. That's not under our control, so although the police department is across the street, so they're nearby. And I think I answered part of those. As far as being taxed, you know, apartments are taxed one way. If you rent them out nightly, then your hotel motel, you pay hotel motel tax. So, so that's, you know, more money to the city than if you did it as apartments. So that's, but then you have more management, more staff, more, a lot of other items. So, so. Environmental have impact. More you talked you about on Mansell Island. I, I just I don't think that's necessarily you got across your, the river your issue. To. I think the fact that you built them across does limit access right. to the beach. In fact, when I went out to walk the property myself, there was somebody strolling along there on the bank, 
which when this is up, they would not have that opportunity to do. Right. So I, I, I think it's probably more of an impediment than it is. And if people in there go out there, well then, I mean, you could, I suppose, put a notice in, in the apartments or something that the island's protected and we're environmentally uh, sensitive and you please don't go tromping around out there. But I, you gotta I cross the river to get to it. Yeah, <laughs> now people find a way. <laughs> All right, is that all for now? Yeah. I think we'll probably have some specific yeah, questions will. for you as we go forward. All right, we'll start with the commissioners again. I guess if you can re reconfirm, uh, Mark, just again, that these are apartments. They're not transient, short-term, VRD, anything like that, or they're not a hotel. The breakfast thing is gone. It's just a common. If it was just confirm all of that. If it was hotel motel, we wouldn't be here. Right, right exactly. So, so we're talking apartments again. So we're talking apartments because we are here. If, okay. If, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. If they rent some of them out short term along the river, then they become hotel and they got to pay hotel motel okay. tax. All right. Parking, the only issue I have, uh, it looks like you're saying there are 95 spaces. I think you need less than that. Yeah. Currently, although there was some place in here and I'm, I, I can't find it right now, but I know I read it, uh, Kevin where you said that if there are some employees in the rental office and stuff, there's not sufficient parking to accommodate that addition at this time, uh, and that something would have to be done about it. I'm not sure how that affects what's going on. Would that be a condition if, if we did go to a program, or would you, it have to come back for us if they made uh, alterations to, to... Condition number one, it, it starts off, if you just total up the square footage of the office space that's, in the, that's on the ground floor, uh, there's insufficient parking provided on site to to address that. Um, that's the the office the office space. It's two um, one thousand two hundred and four square foot spaces. Um, when I totaled those up, um, along with the the basically the office space that was that was in the northern building, um, I I came up with they they exceeded the. Um, they, they have more square footage for office space than they have spaces to provide um, parking. So that's, something's gotta change on the plan in order for them to either keep the space as office or if it's going to be used as general storage and not office. Mark talked about it being used for retail. Um, re, if, if you broke those spaces out and say half of it was, was cordoned off so that it wasn't open for retail, there's a way that you can, you can manipulate the the zoning ordinance requirements and possibly get there, but that's something I've got to see on a plan and this plan doesn't doesn't do that. Okay, now my question then is, mm -hmm. if all of that comes to pass and they have to make some revisions or something to meet that or, or address it in some way, is that something that you will decide on or does it need to come back to us because it's a change in the plan? Based on the conditions of approval, it's something I could do unless you want to Pull it back in for additional review. But it doesn't automatically come by. We'd have to state that. Not with not with condition number eight written the way it is. Okay. I guess question would be too. Maybe you already answered this. Um, let's say they wanted to to be a hotel, and you have all this office space and the cleaning staff and all that, and they've got to park their cars in there. So, is, would there be enough parking to to make it a hotel? Yes. And keep the office. And have space. their employees park there and. It does require less parking. And, I understand and, that. Unless but, they were going to convert all of the downstairs office space into a restaurant, I and even then, I think by the time you took out kitchen area, they'd they'd still exceed the required the requirement for off street parking. So we're saying if the optical guy goes in, there's enough parking there to, for him to have his business. I don't believe so. No. But if it's a so he has to account for parking. But if it's a hotel, they don't have to account for. Parking in that fashion. For, for a hotel motel, it would just be based on the number of units, and then whatever. I, I mean, when when we do a breakdown for any project, it's you're you're picking out the the part of it and saying, okay, well, these are the motel spaces. You need one for each motel unit, and one for a manager, and then you'd break out the the retail office space and charge it at one per 250 square feet if it was large. Um, appliances, it'd be one per 600. If it's uh, a restaurant, it's one per 150. And then you count up the employees in addition to that. So it's it's a formula. And so you have to basically break that whole project down under the formula to say, do I have the right number of spaces? 
right. Oddly, I mean, it looks like it was set up for, it just kind of looks like it's set up for a hotel or apartment, but could go either way. But at this point, retail doesn't qualify to be in this parcel. Is that what we're hearing? Because You'd have to look at the size of the retail, how big a stock room they, they have, like Kevin said. If they've got a big stock right. room, then you know that's a different parking right, requirement. Right, right, because it's based on customer. Yeah, yeah. So you'd have to look at who the person is coming in and then go down to Kevin and say, this is who they are, this is their plan, and then he gets to approve it and say, yes, you meet it, or no, you don't. Okay. If you went down to measure supply and you wanted to get something, their retail space is, yeah. I mean, it, it's size about stable. the size of our lobby in, in the office, but all of their all of their supply is back behind. Well, then, yeah, in that situation, you're talking about a small retail space that's open to the public. The rest of it's all employees, and there may only be one or two employees there, and the rest of it's all product. Right. Well, but yeah. it's not open and accessible to the public, which means that's not going to be counted against them. But right now, I've just got a, I mean, we just have a, a plain white space, and at, with the raw numbers, it won't make it. There you go. Seems like you should put a couple more apartments there. Thought about that. Yeah, roll on <laughs> didn't want to. Just roll on it out. So I'll ask the bike parking question again, because I couldn't find them in this one at all. It's off on the right-hand side. Here, break down. Little guys. Little guys. Okay. Oh, there they are. Thank you. I'm glad it wasn't just me. <laughs> yeah, and there, it, it looked to me like they were, they were going to have to add some to it, which is why condition number two talks about them okay. putting it in based on what the TSP calls for. Which is more why I, why I figured I'd ask where they are because I didn't see them to start out with. Um, and for if it is a retail establishment, does that, and we already talked a little bit about the parking, does that then also change the ADA? parking requirement it, it can and it would yeah. also affect what the bike parking is because if if you have a if you have a commercial space you're supposed to have one at at least one sometimes it's two uh, short-term bike parking space and that's supposed to be basically um, a, as close to the door as your closest space mm -hmm. well then the the long term is something that has more latitude and then it's mainly just making sure that it's covered and mm -hmm. I mean they still have to have something there that you can lock the bike up on but um that's that's why it works really well if if they're providing them underneath the stairwells and there's adequate space for that just putting one bike riser that that really accommodates two bicycles you know you mm -hmm. can lock up two bikes on one riser and then that gives them a covered space and it can also be secured and it's usually well lit and you know granted bike theft now is um my son talks about it. if you put a bike out in Eugene, he said it's gone the next day. But mm -hmm. it's, I mean, there at least you're you're confined within a stairwell, and so that works good, and will allow those to go for cover the short and long term. But when you get to the get to a commercial space, you still have to have the bike parking available closest to the door, or close to the door. Okay. And we kind of touched on the stormwater runoff. Where in the parking lot is the stormwater runoff for the parking lot. It's not totally designed yet, but there'll be a couple oil separator catch basins out in this area. So this will drain to that. This will drain here. This will drain to a swale along that property line. And okay. these will be connected out and into the city storm line. Okay. And is there an overflow, a plan for emergency overflow if, the, if we have... It, it, Let's it, say a lot of rain, as we might have. In there's, the... there's standards in the plumbing code that you have mm -hmm. to meet, and it talks about 10-year, 25-year, 50-year, 100-year storms, mm -hmm. and that's you design around that when you do the final design, and it meets the plumbing code and has to be reviewed by Bob Mitchell for the plumbing standards. Okay. And so basically breaking it down, the swale on the side is there to kind of catch the... That's that's sudden the catch. surge overflow. Not necessarily. It's to catch the runoff from the northern side of the parking lot. You could put oil separator catch basins in there, or you could put a swale which treats it better mm -hmm. before it runs out. And then the rest of the parking lot, you've got oil separator catch basins, which are different than the street. This, in city street, you don't have oil separator catch basins. Right. 
So they're a different kind of catch basin because of they trap the oil and the other pollutants in the catch basin. Okay. And that's a lot of times what people forget is they'll see an oil sheen and if there's a city line there, well, city catch basins are totally different. Mm -hmm. They just allow the water to run in and run right straight out. Okay. Thank you. Kind of a backward standard. Mm -hmm. Well, it's getting quieter. Uh, I think I think for the list that we went through, uh, some of the issues I think we did address in terms of uh, the usage of the property, some of those sorts of things. Some of the issues are not our responsibility. Uh, some of them are excellent suggestions and certainly are reasonable concerns. But again, I don't think it's something that we have the ability to do in this venue like social services and and that sort of thing like, again they're, they're reasonable concerns i just don't think we have the ability to do something about them what we can deal with uh are ingress egress layout of the of the plan making sure it meets the uh, code requirements which kevin has delineated in his report here uh, which they seem to do um, some of the noise concerns I mean, that's typical for everybody, and there is noise abatement, and that's what we'd have to do. We certainly always hope that people will be well behaved. Uh, I'd like to think that they will be here. <laughs> we always hope that. Uh, uh, I guess I would just like some confirmation on the uh, uh, emergency vehicle access for Sandpiper. I mean, Mark did deal with it a bit that it's designed for them to be able to be accessed from their own access and that this contentious kind of uh, easement here was not part of that yeah, ability to do so. Mark actually had a copy of the of the plan and it doesn't show an access going down in there. The building, I mean, I, I'm not gonna get into the fire code requirements, the, the building, I believe that building sprinkled, isn't it, Mark? Yeah. So, so will be. yeah, so so when a building sprinkled, although there are there are provisions for, for emergency vehicle access, um, once you sprinkle a, sprinkle a building, uh, the fire chief has all kinds of latitude in what they can and can't do. If that wasn't a required fire lane of a required access at the time that was reviewed, then it's, I mean, as far as do they have right to access through that, that's a civil matter that the courts would answer. Um, that's not something the planning commission would get involved with. And, you know, you, you also wouldn't be involved with, you know, making sure that they meet their fire code requirements. Um, there's, uh, I mean, there are provisions for emergency vehicle access lanes and what their width is and how they're identified on the ground. And um, if, if Mark's saying, yeah, the, the Southern access is what was done for Sandpiper to meet fire code, then that's what, that's what happened with that. And it may have been, the re if, if there's a dead end over, over um, uh, 150 feet, or if it was even less than that, then it's a question of, well, if the building's protected by a fire sprinkler system, then there may be all kinds of different things that were done at the time that plan was reviewed. But they're not being, they're not being cut off in any way or deprived of access by emergency vehicles. No, okay. not, not that are required emergency vehicle access as I understand it. Right. There's going to be right in there. Uh, okay. Right. Any other questions, concerns, modifications, things that could be done better? Um, one, one thing I might note, one of the comments, um, it wasn't, let's see, I guess, I guess it actually was, it was mentioned in uh, Patrick's uh, bullet points on item number three. He talked about the access. I did note that there are, there are two compact car spaces right, right in the throat of the access. There's two compact car spaces and they're the furthest from Holiday rather than the closest to Holiday. If you want to have smaller vehicles at close to the point of access, Mark could um, actually put the two <coughs> compact spaces over on the easternmost side, yeah. leaving the larger car spaces where the compact car spaces are. And that's just going to encourage you to have smaller cars there and not have some giant Flip them. Dodge yeah. pickup extended cab. <laughs> no, that, Your truck? Yes. My yeah. truck. Um, so, so that, I mean, that is, that is one item that, uh, that you could specifically address one, one thing totally that, that he mentioned that I think is something that could be talked about. Um, 
He also mentioned uh, um, access for garbage service. And in the past, we used to put a standard condition in that said, um, you know, they, they need to have the, the trash and recycling area appropriately sized for the development and have it approved by uh, Recology. If you wanted to put uh, an added provision in under the conditions, you could do that. Um, I, I think it would be justified. Um, I did go down the list and, and identified each one of the items, and, and I, I didn't really find anything more that you would just have to directly address. And um, some of the conditions uh, that are already in there, condition number six and number seven, as far as the hazard mitigation plan goes for stability of the bank, that is uh, kind of getting to a number of comments that they made as far as what's going to happen with the bank. Mm -hmm. um, item number six because they're required to identify where the mean high or high water line is and then show where that riparian setback is, that's not shown on the plan. That's something that is by condition required and that's going to dictate really where is your protected riparian vegetation and where do you need to use native landscaping instead of being able to broaden out and maybe put in rhododendrons and bark dust and anything that's done on that bank. Um, there, Because Mark is also, uh, uh, he's got the credentials in order to do a hazard mitigation plan does quite a few of them for uh, for people in the city that's something that is going to be anything regarding the bank even you know cutting down shrubs even if they're not in the riparian area that's all going to fall on mark for the hazard mitigation Which is part of the building too. right uh, just uh, Mark, you mentioned that the owner wanted the office space so he could manage his properties, obviously, and be into, this would be one of his properties that conceivably he would want to keep an eye on as well, I assume. Yeah, which he wants to do for himself. That, yeah, that's fine, but I mean, it will be monitored also by him, in a sense. It will be monitored 24 hours a day, uh -huh. unless you put the manager on site. Okay, that's so... So if there were difficulties or something, he, he uh, maybe he won't thank me for this, but he would be available to contact to discuss or any issues. Staff. Yeah. Okay. These okay. hotels are staffed 24 hours a day. Okay. And he has people in town 24 hours a day. Every time, okay. So. so there are people to contact if, if there are things that happen that are not kosher. Yeah, but he has that same problem at the hotels. So. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, are we getting close here or anything, anything else we want to address here? So just a question, are we requiring the spots by the egress to be compact instead of regular parking spots? Is flipping that, them? Yes. Flipping, yep. that would be I think we're part adding, of the- We're adding it as a condition for okay. something to look at. I didn't at, know so if we finally actually of, landed on that, but I just wanted to make sure we're clear. But we'd have to make it yeah. part of our, our motion to right. put it in there to, to look at that. Okay. And the office parking issue, I think uh, he that said- who the are. I'm sorry? It comes down to who the tenant is that Kevin gets here. Mm -hmm. Well, again, they can't do anything without meeting the parking and they'd have to work through Kevin to do that. Yeah. He can make those decisions and, and mm -hmm. make it work or not work. He might, he might say, yeah, you can't do it, you know, or vice versa, depending on where the room is. Where it'll be 58, 58 units or 56 units or? 62 units and no office. Yes, <laughs> there you go. On that note. Well, you don't want to change it too much because then it may have to come back to us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> all right, where are we at? I will move that we uh, approve 21-027-CU with the conditions of flipping the entry compact car parking spaces on the north side of the entrance with compact uh, spaces on the east side as well as condition under condition five, confirm access to the trash and recycling with Recology is sufficient. Okay, we have All a second. motion. We have a second. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right.
ordinance administration, Kevin? I don't have anything for you right now. Okay, other business, election of officers. I'll entertain a motion for chairman. I'll make a motion that uh, Chris and Robin stay in the same spot. A second. We have a first and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those abstaining, abstain. <laughs> Robin and I are continuing in our offices, apparently. Uh, keys in the yep. Public comments not related to specific agenda items. Oh, nothing. Planning Commission and staff comments? I have one. Nothing when on the end? When we uh, approved Blue Heron, Wahana Avenue S, we said that there had to be a fence going up. There's no fence going up in those. The people that have bought the houses are landscaping right up to the road. Where? The, Wahana. The, Wahana. Those four little teeny houses. With oh, the, the, that had oh, no, 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 not that one. No, no. S, S, S and Wahana. Oh, no. where the curve is. Oh. And I don't, I, you know, I, I'll have to go back and look, but I don't remember that being a condition of approval. I'm almost positive because Dick and I wanted the sidewalk in and they said, no, we're going to put a wall up. And oh, that wall is side. not going up. And they're landscaping all the way to the road. Yeah, I, I'll, 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 double, I'll double check on the file, but I don't remember that being, I don't remember that being an item on their punch list. Are we having a work session this month? That's a good question. Uh, if we are, uh, either a work session or our next uh, meeting, if you could bring that information back to us and let us know what the status is. All right. So we can decide what to do about it or not do about it. Thanks for keeping an eye on things, Lou. <laughs> well, well right. and, and not only that, but same complex. He's the way he's building it is not the way we approved. I mean the phases. The phases. Okay. So some, some, I guess some study of that and let us know what the situation is, whether it's in co compliance or not. This is. This is S it's on that the curve. Yeah, S on the curve. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I still have my packet. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, that would be good. All right. Any other comments from anyone? Actually, I have a, something. Um, and this has happened. It doesn't happen all the time. And I understand that stuff happens in the city. Gets you know, things get backed up, and it's hard to get this stuff out. But you know, we received the packet, or and I did. I looked, and um, I did get an email on Friday. Thank you, um, on a holiday weekend. So I did. I didn't look at my email, and and I wouldn't even think to look at my email on a holiday weekend. So on Monday, I received this today. I didn't have time to go through it, and it's happened more than several times. It it was worse when I was working because I didn't have time to go look at sites, or even read through the material. And which uh, makes it difficult to make decisions on stuff when you haven't had time to go through it. And I would like to, uh, I don't know how everybody else feels about it, but I would like to see the material come sooner than like two days or three days before. And I can see getting like amendments and things handed later, like something happens, that's gonna happen. But the, the bulk of it actually like, I would like to say 10 days before our meetings, so we have time to go through it and got time to make it out to the sites and see things and read and do studying. I, I don't. I don't think I could ever do a ten. Uh, it's possible that you could get them seven days prior. Uh, that's assuming that I don't go on vacation and come back and get flooded with a bunch of stuff. But um, and I was thinking actually, it would, might be even an advantage for the office because it has to be that then. Because it's, it's the old adage, it's just as easy to keep the top half of the gas tank full as the bottom half. So it's if um, if you, 10 is just, it's easy, just as easy to get a seven in as it is to do three. I mean, you, have, you can't, it, there just has to be a cutoff point. And if there's come changes between now and then, that's just gonna be a, that's kind of happened, so. So anyway. Well, what's the submittal cutoff for the following month's uh, agenda? It's it's usually it's it's usually the planning commission meeting prior, but from the time that we get the 
from the time we get that information, I mean, we're putting together the, you know, you, you submit the request, just like when you brought your stuff in. Mm -hmm. uh, you bring in that information, and then that starts, okay, now we're setting up the file, now we're getting ready to do the um, mailed notice and the published notice, and that's going out. Then we're trying to get, I mean, I, I like to, th this is an example where even though they, even though they were mailed out notice, um, a week prior, some of them didn't get, and I still don't understand why they didn't get notice. Um, I mean, some of them said, well, we didn't get the notice until Friday. And it's like, well, it was mailed the Friday prior to that. And I, I like when we're drafting staff reports, I'd like to at least have an opportunity for the, for the neighbors to say something um, in, in advance of the meeting so that it gets incorporated into the staff report. I mean, if I, if I would have had all of those earlier a week earlier um they would have all been i mean they they would all of those items would have been addressed with with additional findings mm -hmm. and that's the unfortunate thing is you've got a limit on when you can mail out notice and when you can publish notice and so you may not get the comments until shortly before the meeting mm -hmm. so you can't mail out the notices any earlier than there's there's a limit usually usually we're um, the, the published notice is usually in 10 days prior, prior to the 10 days prior to the hearing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, maximum is 20 ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And usually we're falling in between the two. So okay. Kevin, how hard would it be to, instead of us getting these on Friday, getting it on Thursday? I, I think that's probably doable. I'm saying seven um, days. Just I think make one, it a seven yeah, day. More. I'm, I'm, yeah, more. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, I should be able to, I should be able to try and do them Tuesday. Yeah, seven or just, ten days. That's what I'm saying. We get the whole thing. Yeah. Tuesday prior is, is I think. You need to get that. That's why I was saying that's probably the best we're going to get. I think that would be fantastic. I mean, working a full-time job and trying to do, you know, due diligence, it's important to have the time and not have to. Well, so, Jeff's reports are always done really early. He's right on top of everything. <laughs> it's your planning director that's slow. <laughs> And that's nice that a lot of the concerns that people are coming up with the VRDs and stuff, now we can go, ah, that, can't, that will be addressed this time. We know you've had trouble in the past, but we have a moment. I, I will say as we do get comments from the public, whether it be VRD or anything else, we do try to take a look at what conditions or what findings we can put in the reports to mitigate those before they get to you. So we kind of already have a plan of, of what path to go down. And it, it, it definitely helps um, and unfortunately, a lot of times we don't get those comments until Friday or Thursday before the meeting, and it doesn't give us the opportunity to actually look into the concern to be able to answer that question when we come to the meeting. So that's just food for thought. But, you know, receiving an addendum is, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, that, it's an addendum. That's exactly sure. what it is. So I guess maybe what we're saying here is that, is that, is that the bulk of, the, if you can get the bulk of the paperwork out, and and not say well i'm waiting for this piece maybe that you can say yeah. that piece is something that is acceptable to receive you know the little well, then what extra I'm, part. Then you'd rather have the main thing i guess what i'm saying do we make is it just something we all agree on or do we make a motion to say we need to have packets basic packets seven days prior to the i don't think it's a, i don't think it's a motion thing i think i think we're just discussing yeah. procedures yeah. and Tuesday that's what we're going to see it sooner and i'm staff. sure they'll yeah. do the best to comply with that <laughs> I, I think jordan would like to so what else i could do is um can't say this off i hate hearing my own voice um once i get the published notice put together that's when i put the agenda so that's usually about let's say two weeks before the hearing um, I can send out the agenda as well to to all of you. And that way you get an idea of what items, at least for um, for your approval. So then you guys get an idea. At, that, of at, at least. that time, you'd have the addresses on there, right? So the we could address do site is, visits well ahead of time. Correct. And so then whatever it would make is, more sense once you get the people. Correct. But whatever is on the agenda that's on here, uh -huh. for the most part, what you be getting is, for the most part, just number six just filled out and number seven and eight come, come at a later time when I get the actual packets put together. But then that way at least gives you an idea of what to expect. And then when we do get the packets out, you have some sort of idea of. So that would help in a way because then you would know where to go to look at the site well in advance, even though you don't know all the issues yet. 
but when the paperwork did come in with the issues, you'd have already been to the site, or at least Possibly. had time to. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, you, you at least you can allocate your time better. You know how much you're going to need to set aside yeah. for. Uh -huh. So that yeah. would probably help some. That's yeah. actually a good benefit too, because then you know. Um, oh wait, I can't talk about that because that's an ex parte contact. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I wouldn't even know it's mm -hmm. coming up. Yeah, mm -hmm. also that too. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and add that to my. Okay, we'll see some of that helps a little bit. And, that would be very nice. Mm -hmm. And we'll I do see you very on Tuesdays instead of Fridays now. <laughs> and I very oh, much appreciate yeah. getting them electronically, not having the stacks of paper accumulate at my house. <laughs> I like both, but yeah, I like the paper. Yeah, I'm too used <laughs> yeah. to hard copies. <laughs> hard copy yeah. But the, but that notice would I think make a big difference. I think I think so too. Because to that's the yeah that has been the biggest thing. It was even worse when I was working because that just on the weekends there's no getting away. So right. So good. All right. Okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. All right. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.